Um, my name is John Staples. I'm a professor of Russian and Soviet history at the State New University of New York in Fredonia. That's just across the river from Fort Erie in Ontario. And um, my research focuses on Russian and Soviet Mennonites, czarist Mennonites we tend to talk, call them, and particularly on the Mennonites who live uh, in the um, Molochna region. This is very close to the modern city of Mielitopo. Um, this group of Mennonites immigrated to the Tsarist Empire in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, as for the book, uh, the book itself is the first volume of a three-volume set of, of the papers and uh, the documents of a man by the name of Johann Cornes. Cornes was a Mennonite who immigrated as a teen with his family to southern Ukraine in 1805. And he's kind of a remarkable individual. They were poor peasants when they arrived. And he, in fact, would live in a small peasant village on the frontier, what amounted to the frontier, for his entire life. But by the time he was in his late teens, he had begun to be a small trader and then went on to lease and then buy large quantities of land and uh, raise sheep, <coughs> ultimately grow grain. And by the 1840s, he was one of the richest men in all of Ukraine. His, his family, or his wealth was estimated as something like three million rubles in the early 1840s at a time when uh, a, a peasant laborer might make three rubles a day. So it was a phenomenally large state. And I think that what makes Cornys unique, though, it's, and special for historians besides his remarkable life, is that he was a, a record keeper. And as he got rich and became extremely engaged with the czarist government, first of all locally, then regionally, and finally nationally, he kept careful t track of every letter he wrote, of every report he wrote, of every study of neighboring people he wrote. In the end, it added up to literally tens of thousands of pages of documents. And those documents record not only the life of these Mennonites in the region, but their studies of the neighboring um, Nogai Tatar people, a semi-nomadic Tatar people. And there, there are studies of the uh, Ukrainian and Russian peasants that settled in villages around them. And the result then is, well, I don't quite want to say a ground-level view of these people, because by the time he was making these reports, Cornelius himself was wealthy and was a peasant in name only. But uh, it, is, it is a very unusual look at such people, you know, in, in the czarist era, most of what we know of peasant life is, is based on material either recorded from the central government or recorded by members of the nobility, often of their own service states. So to have this type of source, this rich source from a guy who lived in the region in a local village is truly unusual. When Catherine the Great took over Russia, uh, one of her goals was to remake Russia. She was, after all, uh, a Prussian by birth and culture. And she wanted to remake Russia in an image that, that matched her understanding of what amounted to a civilized world. And part of her project then was to occupy the region that she would name New Russia. That is, the area along the uh, coast of the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. And so Catherine expanded into this region uh, mainly you know, as she um, went to war with the Ottoman Empire and she captured the Crimea and other areas. And having captured them, she, in her mind, this was, a, this was a blank slate. The reason she called it New Russia is she imagined creating a new place out here, a model for old Russia, if you like. And so she went out seeking what she called colonists, and what she meant by this is, is progressive um, Westerners who might immigrate to the region. And alongside them, she wanted Slavic peasants to immigrate to the region. And she imagined that the Slavic peasants would, in practice, even though they would be new to the region, would become the colonial population, while the Westerners would come in and become the colonist population. Strange idea, but... We see then an active recruitment campaign that brings from particularly Prussia and the other German states 
um, Mennonites in significant numbers, and Catholic and Lutheran and separatist peasants as well in significant numbers. And they form communities right across um, what is now southern Ukraine, but particularly a large one um, along the Dnieper River, what is Khortitsa, right? The Khortitsa settlement, but at the Khortitsa island, and a second one on the um, Molochnov uh, River that flows into the Sea of Azov at modern-day Melitopol. And these communities were brought in, they were seen as progressive, and the Mennonites in particular were. They were among the best of the farming communities in Prussia. They, you know, Catherine was eager to have them, and they were eager to get out of Prussia because the uh, Prussian um, state was becoming increasingly intrusive into their religious lives, which they rejected. So they come as this, this significant group of settlers. And they came as Mennonites with a fairly clear view of what they wanted. Separate from the world, they regarded themselves as, and they called themselves, the quiet in the land. So they wanted to create separate communities. And within those separate communities, they wanted to be allowed, left free to practice their faith as Anabaptists as they saw fit. And they negotiated with, with Catherine and then ultimately with her successors a privilegium, or a, I will have the best word for it, a set of privileges defined by the state. These included, most importantly, an exemption from military service because they were pacifists, but also a, a right to land and a kind of unusual political arrangement in which they were free to elect a um, local village and district governments that that dealt with the state for them. And we therefore get these pockets of settlement, and they were remarkably successful. They, by the middle part of the 19th century, Mennonites were among the um, most productive farmers in Ukraine, and beginning in the middle of the 19th century, invested in industry, and so we see them emerge, um, particularly things like windmills, but eventually also steel mills and manufactories that that put them on the leading edge of industrialization in the Russian Empire. And they produced eventually significant proportions of all of the agricultural equipment, for example, that were sold in Ukraine. This makes them a, a special case uh, that has never been well understood because ultimately... As the new German state arose in the 1870s and as uh, anti-German sentiment grew in the Tsarist Empire, building up to the First World War, the state turned against them. And during the war, they, they um, had much of their, or parts of their property confiscated. And when the revolution came, they were, they were wiped out to all intents and purposes, leaving them with a period from the um, time of the Russian Revolution um, where... Um, well, but from the time of the Russian Revolution to the end of the Second World War, best estimates say that half of all adult men in the Mennonite community died unnatural deaths. And in many cases, their homes were even removed, wiped from the face of the earth in some villages. Their, their furniture was taken away, and, and even the physical traces of their existence there are partially destroyed. More than that, though, Soviet history eliminated them, made them part of the so-called blank pages of, of Soviet history, so that for a long time there was very little in the way of good historiography, um, apart from a small, usually not professional, history written from within their own community in the West. Um, so it's only with the collapse of the Soviet Union that that history has begun to reemerge in substantial ways. And documents like these ones, produced by Johan Cornys, therefore provide us with an amazing look into the Mennonite community, but lo and behold, a much broader look into frontier life in this area of modern-day Ukraine. Within um, the Mennonite historical community today, there is a tendency to refer to the Mennonites in the Tsarist Empire as the Mennonite Commonwealth, which suggests a substantial degree of isolation. Fighting against that is an alternative historiography that 
suggests that perhaps the problem is that the, the points of contact are not well understood. But there is a, an important periodization here because um, they arrived at the same time as a lot of other people arrived. The only large existing community when they arrived um, in southern Ukraine was the Tatar community. And that community was still semi-nomadic, ranged over a large area of land. So they arrived alongside them um, peasant immigrants, Slavic peasant immigrants from particularly Smolensk, but also Tsar Alexander I allowed the, um, a significant group of various religious sectarians, most famously the Dukabors, also Malakanya, to settle in the same region. And across the river from the Mennonites, we also see um, significant settlements of Germanic um, Lutherans and Catholics. So this whole collection of people arrives all at about the same moment in history. And as far as I can see, in their first 25, almost 30 years of settlement, they follow similar paths of development. And while language and religion separate them, they also have significant interaction. It's only in the 1830s, after a, a terrible drought and famine and um, wave of cost, that the Tsarist government intervened suddenly in the region. And it forced the Slavic peasants into repartitional communes for the first time. Until this point in time, we see you know, peasants, a, a name that really, I don't know his first name, but Lukashenko, a fellow by the name of Lukashenko, of all things. And uh, he's a peasant who looks like he's on the similar trajectory to a guy like Johan Cornings. He leases some land, he buys some land, he establishes a, an estate of some, not an estate, but a, a land holding of something like, well, it would be 2,500 hectares probably today. Large numbers of sheep. Now, so these are people who, who seem to be following this same course. But when the state intervened out of a sense that it was fed its obligation to keep peasants alive by making sure that they were fed, it crushed the ability of the um, non um, German peasants to to follow that same trajectory, and we see them sort of pushed into a um, subsidiary, subsidiary role in the regional economy. That role continues to have elements of interaction with groups like the Mennonites, um, but more often as um, agricultural employees, for example, than as um, prosperous agriculturists or merchants. So there is a sharp change there. And the, 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 by the 1860s, there emerges an interesting re-engagement that follows religious paths. As baptism, the, the Baptist religion emerges, we see in the 1860s a beginning of a cross-filtration um, um, religiously where now, by 1900, for example, we see Baptist tent missions in places like the city of the modern-day city of Malachansk, which was the largest settlement in the region, where Ukrainians and Mennonites are are meeting and interacting, but they did so secretively because, of course, conversion from Orthodox is illegal for them. So, uh, to some degree or other, the interactions are submerged. The second problem is that, that we have a tendency to know these stories from the top looking down. So that we know, for example, of wealthy Mennonite industrialists or farmers by the end of the 19th century. And it seems like they retain a fairly separate life. But what little we know of the lower levels of interaction suggests that, you know, for example, small grain merchants who were Mennonite were interacting on a daily basis with Ukrainian grain growers, and they spoke Ukrainian. They also spoke, you know, they, of necessity, Russian and Yiddish. And so we think that there is a bigger interaction. I think I should say that there's a bigger interaction with those lower levels than the top-down history suggests. So it's a, it's a developing history. At first, though, I think they were quite isolated because uh, the Mennonites spoke only German. And 
a particular Mennonite Low German at first um, that that would have been unintelligible to the local populations, and they themselves relied entirely on interpreters to deal with the local populations. Um, so that ensured a degree of separation, as did the religious laws made facilitization illegal and made it illegal for Ukrainians to convert. I've been amazed by the degree to which, in the end, Corny's interacts with very high-level officials. Um, both Tsar Nicholas I and Tsar Alexander I actually had tea in Corny's home in his village at one point. So, you know, he see very high-level people recognized him. And he became a, a trusted confidant of a fellow by the name of Pyotr Kepin. And Kepin was a statistician, um, a high-level official with the Ministry of State Domains in St. Petersburg. Um, he dealt with Pavel Milyukov. And Milyukov uh, was a young official in the ministry at the time, uh, but one who came from privilege and high status and would ultimately uh, be a key architect of the great reforms of the 1860s. So he, he, he seems, he, in the end, he, he finds himself interacting with this, these people um, almost as a friend, although clearly of socially lower status. And it struck me as I, as I followed this correspondence that it tells a story about the inadequacies of Tsarist administration, that there were almost no competent people on the frontier. Uh, who the state lie upon in its large kind of social engineering projects. And so when it found somebody, even if it's somebody was a, a, um, a Mennonite who only spoke German and lived in a little village, then it, it allowed them to prosper. And Corny's, uh, he never spoke anything but Russian. And he was never um, comfortable outside of his village or his local region. Uh, the, one of the most striking things to me is that in 1827, he traveled to Saxony to buy sheep. And it was a remarkable trip for him. He hadn't been to Prussia since he came to, you know, as a teenager to, to Russia. And what he found there was very impressive. But in the end, he wrote home and he said something to the effect of, um, you know, the Malachna, Ukraine, Russia, is a land of opportunity. People like me could never have hoped to succeed and have the influence that I do. So, you know, that, that idea of a land of opportunity is something we associate with settlers coming to North America, uh, arriving in a place where there was relatively little control and remarkable freedoms. Uh, by comparison, I'm inclined to think of the Tsarist Empire as a place tightly controlled from the center. And yet, that's not how Corny's experienced it. He experienced it as a place of freedom and opportunity to, to become wealthy, but also so to become deeply engaged in the, um, in the shaping of his community and of the entire region. So that was a surprise to me. At the other end of the spectrum, um, I, I've been... Um, I've been fascinated to find avenues into the Mennonite community that I didn't expect through Corning's work. Uh, we know much about kind of the, the basic economic story of the Mennonites, of their success. We have accounts of the religious life, although particularly in the early period, uh, they're not necessarily very good. But as you look deeper into his correspondence, you begin to see emerge pictures of internal family life and dynamics that, that aren't necessarily what I expected to see. Uh, for example, and maybe the most vivid example to me, is that we see in Corny's a, a concern with the status and rights of women, of all things. I mean, he is the patriarch of a large family, and he runs things, and we know almost nothing about his wife except that he clearly loved her. But we do begin to see emerge a concern about, for example, the rights of women to make choices in marriage. Um, and this emerges in, a, in an odd kind of backhanded way. Cornings decides at some point in um, the late 1820s, or he's asked, to write a report about the Nogai Tatar. Specifically, he's asked by the state to figure out how to civilize, as he put it, 
bees, nomadic people. And one of the conclusions he reached is that the problem within the nomadic community was that there was no respect for women. Uh, that women were treated badly, they were treated almost like slaves, and that they had no choice in things like marriage, that they could not marry for love. And so he concluded that this was harmful to the moral upbringing of their children, and morality, actually, after all, was a precondition for being, in his mind, civilized. And so uh, that's an interesting idea, and then it's reflected in his personal life, that his own children, he had two, of, two who survived to adulthood, married very unusually late and seemingly for love. This was a, a concern he openly expressed at their betrothal, whether these betrothals were, were a consequence of love. Now, you know, all of our understanding of how such relations of marriage in particular and family life worked in this period, uh, either from the you know, Ukrainian, daughter, czarist, Russian story, or for that matter from the German peasant story, suggests that the notion of romantic love is, is almost unheard of, that marriage was an economic contract necessitated by survival for such things. And here we have uh, a Mennonite writing about romantic love as a priority, and that was a surprise to me and a delight to me as I try to understand the man. Yeah, I think that you have to begin by saying he became the wealthiest man in Ukraine um, out of a kind of personal drive and something of a genius for business. He recognized very early on that, um, that there wasn't any money to be made out of growing grain in his region, at least when he arrived there, because it was separated from markets by such a long way. Heavy, perishable goods would not sell. So at the age of, well, probably 17, the records are a little vague, he began marketing butter and cheese, loading bo loads of butter and cheese from his community onto a wagon and heading off on a several-day trip to Simferopol in the Crimea um, and, and selling cheese. And then uh, in 1809, when the government decided to promote sheep raising in the region, he recognized this as an opportunity and there was a part of the land that had been designated for Mennonite settlement that would be settled because there wasn't enough population for it. And in truth, it wasn't very settleable. It was only useful as pasturage. So he applied for and received a very cheap lease from the state and began growing sheep or raising sheep. And by the time he was 25, he owned the largest sheep herd in the region. And he saw another advantage um, that, the, that the government, again, through its what was called the Guardianship Committee for Foreign Settlers, which uh, looked after people like this in the region, was interested in improving the quality of wool in the region by introducing um, fine wool merino sheep from the West. And so he applied for it, received some. And, and what, what begins to happen here is that Cornies was always very quick to recognize um, trends in the marketplace. And he subscribed to agricultural newspapers from Odessa and from Prussia and eventually from, um, <coughs> excuse me, Moscow as well. And he followed closely the markets. And he had something of a genius for following those markets and, um, and finding ways to make money. There's a, a, a second buried story here that I, I have to be cautious of because it's not as clear as I'd like it to be. But in, the, um, in 1812... Uh, Tsar Alexander II allowed the um, British Foreign Bible Society to begin work in Russia. And, you know, this is an odd moment. Alexander experienced what he characterized as a kind of religious rebirth. He, was a, he became a pietist. And, and the, for the Orthodox state to permit the Russian Foreign Bible Society to operate in Russia was unusual, but they saw the moment and they seized upon it. And so we see the sudden creation of Bible Society outlets across Russia. And these Bible Society outlets, the Bible Society's formal mission was to um, distribute Bibles in local languages. And it, it claimed that it did not proselytize, it simply provided Bibles. So we find then by 1818, Bible Society representatives showing up in this Mennonite community. Pietists broadly saw this community as an opportunity, they saw it as a frontier beachhead. Um, they sometimes characterized it as um, 
as you know, a light on a hill from which they could spread what they saw as the true pietist religion. And so they come to this isolated Mennonite community. They assume that it is going to be rich ground for establishing a Bible society outlet. And sure enough, we see one form with Cornies as a leading figure in the local Bible society. Well, the reason this is economic is that the Bible society existing in a, um, a Russian world which was, was separated hierarchically between uh, the nobility and the rest of society. The Bible Society provided pathways across the divide into the, um, higher, the noble world. And so, Cornys winds up making contact with people in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, sometimes very high status. Uh, perhaps the most important one being uh, um, a fellow by the name of Traugot Blucher, who was uh, a Moravian Brethren merchant uh, connected to the Moravian Brethren settlement in the, in, at Sarepta on the Volga. But, but Blucher was a, a, a grain and wool merchant in Moscow. And Cornings traveled to Moscow on government business, met Blucher, established a business relationship with him and a close friendship. And for the first time, suddenly, his community, through him, and he in particular, gained uh, uh, an access to international markets that bypassed um, middlemen and permitted him to make scads of money. This is where he really got rich. So, so these accidental contacts forged through a Bible society that cross social lines provided, I think, a, a unique opportunity for him. Um, the second thing, though, is that the Mennonites came in, in several waves of colonization. The first one, 1804 to 1806. A second came beginning in 1818 and into the early 1820s. By the time the second one came, Cornys was well established in his community, known to the state. And as they looked for somebody in the community to to um, to <clears throat> be a liaison in the new settlement, Cornys emerged as an important figure in the settlement commission. The reason this is important for his wealth is that he um, quickly recognized and purchased a right to the um, the monopoly on the sale of spirits in the region. They called it the they called it brandy, you know, the brandy lease, but it meant all spirits. And I think this was definitely a matter of you know having made some contacts. And between his wool trade and monopoly on the selling of all hard alcohol in the region, both within his Mennonite community and to the surrounding peasant communities, these two things, a combination of good fortune and entrepreneurship and a bit of a business for, uh, genius for business, collectively to get fabulously wealthy. In 1991, or rather in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was a very poorly documented area of history. Um, there were a handful of historical studies, um, notably one um, by a guy named David Rempel, who was raised in that community and then in the early Soviet immigrated to the United States and went to Stanford, um, but not widely known. And then there was a, a further, um, there was one really very good overview of the committee written by a British or New Zealand anthropologist named James Urry that for the first time provided a, a good modern assessment of the Mennonites, although of necessity because it was published in the late Soviet era, um, one that was narrowly focused on sources emerging from the Mennonite community itself. What was missing was any sense of the um, Russian and Ukrainian side of the story, the evidence, the evidence from the Ukrainian and Russian arts. Harvey Dick actually played a leading role in this. He was working in Odessa in the early Soviet era, or post-Soviet era, actually writing a history of the city of Odessa, when he requested a, a, a set of documents, very poorly um, cataloged. They basically said, you know, documents in the German language or something to that effect. And when he started receiving files, he realized that what he had found was a massive trove, 120,000 pages of documents um, kept by the Mennonites themselves, captured um, when um, Nazi Germany invaded in um, 
1941, and then disappeared. Thought, everybody thought they had ceased to exist. And they were sitting in this archive badly cataloged. And this, this began a renaissance of, of Tsarist Mennonite studies. Um, and and so, so part of the story then is it provided professional historians in the West with an opportunity to, to examine all the they hadn't seen before. But there's a, there's a second really important interesting part of this story, I think. Because, you know, the characterization of Mennonites in southern Ukraine in the 19th century as, as Ukrainian is kind of um, ahistoric. They didn't understand themselves to be Ukrainian. They understood themselves to be Mennonites and subjects of a Russian czar. Um, but the territory is, of course, Ukrainian. Well, uh, there is a very fine Department of World History in Dnipro, the Dnipro National University. I mean, the, at that time, the Dnipropetrovsk National University, of course. And within it, there was a little group of historians that's already interested in the history of what they called Germans in Russia. So they had, be, they had already conducted some studies of the local region. Um, and they published a, a journal um, that was devoted to these questions. And they were doing interesting work already. But they didn't recognize the Mennonites as a particular subset of the story. And they were poorly funded, so the, their ability to do kind of really wide reaching work was limited. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were suddenly freed in many ways. They were ideologically freed to think about these stories. And led by uh, a woman by the name of Svetlana Bobolyova, who was the, the um, chair of the Department of World History, and driven by some very graduate students, one um, her, her name is uh, Natalia Wenger, who is now the, today, she's inherited the job as chair of the Department of World History at the Nipro National University. They, they began exploring the questions, these questions of Mennonite history and the history of other Germans in the region in ways that were highly creative. Um, and here's what happened that I think is fascinating. Driven particularly by Bobolyova, for whom I have immense respect, Bobolyova and the, what I think of as the Dnipro Petrovsk, or the Dnipro school of Mennonite history, decided that, that the pursuit of the history of Mennonites was also the construction of a unique Ukrainian history. Um, her, her argument was that the setting in what is today Ukraine and the attitude of people in Ukraine towards the Mennonites was was separate from the attitude of Russians, that it was um, because Ukrainians had their own sense of being subject to Russia, that, that they had some sort of shared feeling. So she claimed the Mennonites as Ukrainian in practice and constructed a history of the Mennonites that argues that Mennonites are evidence of a, a proto-Ukrainian state that was inherently more tolerant than the Russian state. And this gave a lot of deriving force to the study of Mennonites. And this occurred at the same time that Harvey Dick was up to do research in the region. And ultimately, um, you know, in the mid-1990s, I was showing up to do research in the region. And we forged some close relationships, and um, people from there began in these fields and communicating with us. Uh, Natalia Wenger, who I mentioned, who did a Fulbright in North America, came to Toronto while she was here, uh, wrote what I think is the finest full-scale study of, um, of an aspect of Mennonite, sorry, Mennonite industrialization, um, a very a long, thorough, and smart book. And so you get, you get this emergence of a specifically Ukrainian school of history focusing on Mennonites and other Germanlers and Bulgarian settlers as well. They, they, they've cast their net more widely. So all of this has contributed to a new history that is quite rich and still growing. Um, there will be, um, in February, I think, due, a new book from the University of Toronto Press, a collection of essays written by scholars of um, Mennonites in Russia and the Soviet Union, in which there are several entries from the folk in Dnipro. I think that the story of Johann Korn offers an interesting opportunity for people to think their way into a region. 
that is very hard to think your way into otherwise. That our access to the history of places, um, rural places, frontier places, like where Cornish lived, is, is very limited because the sources are so limited. And so when you, when you begin reading Johann Cornish, his correspondence and his studies, you find yourself open to a world that we almost didn't know existed and open to it in fascinating ways. And some of those ways are, frankly, irritating. I mean, you know, the, the treatment of Cornies and Mennonites of, you know, local people sometimes, you know, other local people sometimes you find not very attractive. Uh, sometimes there are very endearing ways, like I say, his, his concerns with the treatment of women and his, his affection for his grandson, for example, um, are fascinating and endearing. Or, or is the, in, we find him in the middle 1830s ordering hair tonic, you know, his, his kind of um, worry about going bald. These kinds of very personal things are endearing. But alongside them, we have a sense of a population broadly, not just Mennonite, but broadly, that finds in... Uh, on the frontier, opportunities to create lives that are not as constrained as the, the conventional history of Tsarist Russia might su suggest. And I think that is enormously valuable in, in giving life to uh, a history that might not be well understood. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye.